Oops. Hold on a minute. Got to pull that off. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of UFO Man Live. My name is Tim, or UFO Man. Uh, we're going to go around the panel and introduce everybody, but we're going to start first with our special guest, Dr. Simeon Hine. Uh, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Introduce yourself, please. Hey guys, I'm Simeon, and uh, I am getting some feedback. I'm getting some feed. I'm hearing you turn off the YouTube speakers. and turn off Streamyard. Okay. Hey, really? hey guys. Oh, thanks for having me here tonight. And uh, I'm a researcher. And hold on a second. You're still getting feed. You're still okay. Getting... Got it. Thanks. I I'm a researcher. I've been interested in these alternative topics for about 25 years. I first discovered remote viewing in 1996, and it got me interested in that subject and many other related subjects. And uh, that's pretty much what I've been focused on since, uh, you know, <clears throat> since the late 90s. And do you have a website or a YouTube channel? I'm guys, I'm getting a bit of feedback here. If I turn the volume down, I can't hear you. I think you, you have to turn the volume up on the StreamYard window and then turn off the volume on the YouTube window. So just go to YouTube, go to the, the oh. broadcast and turn that down. That'll get rid of the feedback. Okay, I must have it. Sorry, you're right. I must have it open, right. have it open on another channel. Yeah. Gotta love technology these days. One second here. I do have a... I think there's like three um, of them now. <laughs> we're, we're gonna we're gonna figure this out, everyone. Just just a minute. We just have technical difficulties. What? Can you still hear right. us? You're right. Okay, got it. <clears throat> Good. Well, we sorry, that was on my mind. I had it open uh, from the link. Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks, Tim. I did hear your question. Yeah, I have a YouTube channel. I put up videos about you know. Remote viewing, uh, UFOs, crop circle research that kind of came out of RV, you know, newer interpretations of quantum mechanics, including many worlds interpretation, parallel realities. And even, you know, the topic of cold fusion and low energy nuclear reaction is also related to this topic. We're talking about it, a real paradigm shift here. That's what I focus on. I'm on Twitter and I'm on YouTube. People can just put my name into YouTube to uh, to see that. Cool. Thomas? Hey, good evening, everybody. I'm Thomas Fessler. I'm a technologist, ufologist, ancient alien theorist, and someone who's really advocating disclosure. I've uh, been a longtime fan of UFO Man, and I'm happy to be part of the UFO, UFO Man crew. Tommy? Hi, folks. I'm Tommy Highway. I'm an author. I'm a network engineer. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, we have a great show for you, as always. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for being here with us, of course. We really appreciate uh, you giving us the time. And uh, let's just go ahead and get right into it, Timothy. Right. Okay. Um, I will do so, Thomas. Um, <laughs> he called me Timothy. Okay. Tonight, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, what remote viewing really is. Um, how can it be verified as accurate information and repeated accurate information? And I would like that if, I would like to ask Dr. Hine what he thinks about that. Um, how can remote viewing be proven to the layperson as verifiable accurate information? Uh, it's it's a good question. There's a number of ways you can do that. Uh, you know, going back to the, you know, Russell Targ and Hal Putoff days, and I hope everyone's seen that documentary by, uh, uh, I think, uh, who, who was it? Well, Russell Targ produced it. Um, it, it. Third Eye Spies. You've all seen that? Yeah. So you can see, you can show it in different ways. You can take especially gifted subjects, people like Ingo Swan or Joe McMonagle, who we're going to talk about in a bit, 
and you can give them, you know, tasks to do. You can do RV with them and see how accurate they are. That's one way to show that it's there. You can do repeated experiments like Daryl Bem from Cornell has done repeatedly with what some people call presentience. That's what Dean Radin calls it. Or Daryl just calls it precognition, where you do these experiments where you give people, you know, there's a set of words and then you kind of ask them to write some words down. And then later on, you've already chosen a specific set of words to reinforce. And you'll find that it sort of matches what they sort of picked, even though they had no idea what the computer was going to pick ahead of time into it out of a whole group of words or with different types of photos to see galvanic skin response to right. nice photos versus scary or erotic photos. Right. And so you can do that type of testing over and over again. And another way, which I personally like, is through personal experience. Uh, that's how I enjoy dealing with the public about this topic is to have people come and take classes from me, you know, in person or online, just for the experience of seeing it for yourself. That's what convinced me, Tim, and the rest of you that it worked. It, it, I think if I had read about this in a book, it wouldn't have convinced me because I had had 27 years of the edu type of education that we go through from kindergarten to PhD with no break. And I was pretty indoctrinated by the time I got my PhD about how reality really works. I mean, hey, I'm the guy with a right. PhD, right? Right. I know. You don't know anything, but you think right. you do. And you're you're going to you're going to not look at evidence that doesn't fit your worldview because you're focused on your little corner topic, unfortunately, highly specialized. That's the way academics is now. You're publishing and you're focused on your topic and you don't want anything to interfere with that. It was my experience at the Farsight Institute in 1996, having read Courtney Brown's book, Cosmic Voyage. I thought, I can't believe this. I mean, is this really true that you can see things at a distance and describe <laughs> future events or things on Mars. And I thought the only way to find out would just go take the class, take a right. leap of faith, plunk down your money, go out there. And I took the class and it, for me, there were really solid results at, and, and many other people in the class. I'm, I'm talking about being able to accurately draw a picture that's hidden in a folder 20 feet away from you that you won't see for another two hours or maybe an hour, maybe 20 minutes. How did you describe it so accurately? It's just uh, way beyond what you'd expect if you were just guessing. So those are a number of ways that you can uh, do it. And there's, by the way, there's a fourth category, applied viewing. That's something that Joe McMonagle has been uh, so good at. Actually, he received a Legion of Merit award from the US government for his right. viewing sessions, right? Applied viewing where you're able to describe something on the other side of the planet in such accuracy and detail that it actually helps the people over there in whatever they're attempting to accomplish know about something that there is no other way they could have known about it. Uh, we were talking about some examples before the show started. Uh, the, the 1979 uh, Soviet backfire bomber, I believe it was, that a Libyan pilot defected with in Africa and Carter had well, he wanted to get it before anyone else did for the electronics, obviously. Right. And they got the the viewing teams working. They had Dale Graff was involved. Joe was involved. Some other viewers. And they narrowed it down to a couple square kilometers out of the entire continent. I wow. asked Dale what the cue was. Dale Graff, one of the people... He came from Wright Patterson and he's written a number of books, Tracks in the Psychic Wilderness and so forth. And he did lead he did lead the program for a while at DIA. And Dale said the target cue was a plane went down somewhere in Africa, <laughs> located at a huge continent to get it a couple square kilometers, and you send your Delta Force team out there and then they they see it. They're almost right on top of it. That's incredible. That's a type of proof too, an applied situation where it could have been over <clears throat> thousands and thousands of square miles and you got it the first try. Uh, hmm. As Kit Green once said, someone who's now associated with, uh, well, he's been associated with TTSA and uh, various other, he was at the CIA's strange desk. He was the guy that got some of the funding going. 
And as he put it to us at one of, you you can see him in Third Eye Spies because that was from the IRVA conference. As he told us at that lecture where I was present, he said, you know, I didn't need statistics. There were three solid viewing examples where the viewer was so accurate. One in real time when he was having someone view something. Two were actually, uh, one was in real time of a church and then there was another target where something happened in the basement and the viewer detached from the target and started viewing the basement where a lamp had fallen over and the dog had got his paw on the glass and there was blood. And that's what the viewer was picking up. Wow. Was blood and an accident and, and Kit thought he must be way off target. And then the third target in that set, I believe was the NSA Sugar Grove facility in West Virginia. You know, that's, listening facility for, I guess we've been told now it was for Soviet satellites, where both Ingo Swan and Pat Price viewed it so accurately to the point where they got the super classified code names on the folders inside wow. file cabinets and on desks. Apparently, according as we're told in Third Eye Spies, all related to pool and cues and, you know, plain pool. And that caused such consternation, apparently, we're told, within the security, you know, uh, organizations within the government that someone 3,000 miles away could read special access program <laughs> code names in a super secure facility. Anyway, Kit said after that he didn't need to see any more statistics. That's the it's kind of a long winded answer to your question. Yeah, but very appropriate. Th thank you. Uh, what I was going to ask is repeated um, results being the same or virtually right. the same is another way to verify the actual validity of remote viewing. Yes? Yes, and that's what our modern science likes to see, repeatability, verifiability. That's the essential feature of modern science is that if you've identified uh, an objective process that works a certain way, you'd like to see it repeated no matter who does it. Now, this gets a little, uh, it gets into areas that are interesting because everyone's slightly different. And RV is something uh, that, as Russell Targ said, you can't always create it in someone if it's not, you know, if it's not there, but you can extinguish it in someone who has a lot of ability through boredom. In other words, testing the same person over and over again, they're going to get bored. Uh, that is, is what uh, uh, Ingo got bored with them. Ha he, they were having him view things in a box. Ingo, what's in the box? And he, he got it correctly a number of times, just like Yuri Geller did. Bef before Ingo was there, they had Yuri Geller. And Yuri was, do it's in Third Eye Spies. If you get the bonus edition of Third Eye Spies, you can see the whole thing with Yuri Geller. One object in the box, I, I don't know if he missed any, of maybe one. I mean, it was really accurate. But if you keep doing that with someone, they're going to get bored. As Ingo said, I can put my mind anywhere in the universe. Uh, this is a trivialization of my abilities just to have me view objects in a box. And right. he turned, uh, and that's how he came up with another system to get beyond viewing leaves and objects in boxes, little creatures they put in there and stuff. Uh, he realized you could eventually, he got this idea talking with Jacques Vallée, believe it or not. Jacques Vallée was in, yeah, it's all sort of kinds of, Jacques Vallée was involved in the early SRI research. And he apparently gave Ingo the idea of addressability, like memory in a computer, memory addressability that we're all familiar with now. And Ingo turned that into the idea of coordinates. Eventually it became geographical coordinates, then random numbers to make it more interesting. So you do want it to be verifiable and repeatable, but you don't want to do it to the point where your psychic subject gets bored. Like right. with Zener cards where they're just five and you keep doing, you can extinguish right. the ability. So yeah, that's what we're looking for, verifiability. 
uh, over one person over many years, as is obviously the case with Joe and Ingo and many others like that. Or statistically, you can show that with large groups of people like Jessica Utz did when she reviewed it for Congress in 1995, you know, they before closing the program, they asked for a review and she did a review of just a few sessions. I think it was 10 or 11. It wasn't hundreds, but she did statistically show that the viewers were getting about one out of every three uh descriptors correct where you would expect by chance one out of four and over many sessions that would be statistically significant it's about it's about a seven percent increase over what you would expect from guessing that doesn't sound like a lot but seven percent's a lot in in statistics if it's repeated over and, and that's what jessica found so there's yeah we want the repeatability the verifiability we have to do it in a way that works with people too who are doing the viewing uh, it's applied remote viewing used when you look back in time. Like a historical target looking right. back into the past. Yeah. Right. That would be one sort of application. Um, it's also used in the future. Uh, you're aware of people that have done this with so-called ARV. I believe that's brought up in Third Eye Spies where you predict the outcome of a sports game or financial markets at the end of the week. Uh, that's looking forward ahead a week in time. Right. That has been shown to be real. Um, the Both Russell Targ and Hal Putoff did their own experiments. Russell's group was called the Spook Group, and they did it at Stanford with some investors' money. And it was so successful, I was told by someone that was in that group, the investor came in in his gold chains driving his sports car and said, it's so good, can you do it for me twice a week? Instead of once, and these were starving graduate students, they weren't getting any money from the winnings. But it worked that well, he wanted to do it more often. They didn't want to do it anymore because it's a lot of work. And because of the rules of the university, they couldn't get paid for doing it. Oh. But that sort of thing does show. Greg Kalajic, I believe how you pronounce his name, uh, he was, well, he's a very talented athlete, adventurer, and he decided to do this for like 13 years with just with himself, uh, you know, assigning t- a t- up or down target for the mark, you know, any particular commodity or uh, currency or something like that in a, in a couple days time. And he was able to achieve 60% accuracy, 70 out of wow. 5,400 and something trials. Now, believe me, I used to teach stats. If there was nothing going on there, it's going to go to the mean eventually. I mean, we could understand that someone could be lucky the first 10 or 20 or 30. But in any sort of random process, if there's nothing going on, it's going to converge to 50-50 if you and I were just guessing. But he got it up to 65%, even 70% for a whole bunch of them. And he made a chunk of change out of it. He didn't think it was a lot of money after 10 years, $160,000 or something. I mean, he said he earned a lot more from his job, but it proved that this really does work. And when we've done ARV, we've gotten similar results uh, just for fun. Uh, So those are the sorts of things that show that it does work in the past, but it also works into the future. Now, that raises a lot of questions about how how does reality work when you can see the future? Yeah. Where is it already there? Yeah. Right. One little thing, uh, uh, Simeon, don't you kind of, you know, refer to this as not just remote viewing, kind of like more like residence viewing where you're kind of dialing into it? Could you talk on that a little bit? Right. I see it more, you know, Upton Sinclair did write that book uh, almost like 100 years ago now, wasn't it? Mental Radio. Russell Targ's talked about that book a lot. It's kind of like mental radio, but it's not an electromagnetic signal. Um, It doesn't seem to have the boundaries of an electromagnetic signal. And it's been tested. Even people locked in a Faraday cage room can do it, even though there's no electromagnetic signals coming to that room. But yeah, it's, uh, it was called remote viewing. I believe it was Ingo Swan that invented that term. But uh, as I was mentioning the other day in another interview, you know, they wanted to make it sound sexy and cool because you're getting a grant. 
from a government agency. It's got to sound cool. They're not going to fund something that sounds really boring. You know, look at the military hardware and stuff that gets funded. It's got to sound cool. There's got to be an X in there and the name. I mean, right. they, they knew what they were doing for marketing purposes. Remote viewing sounds like satellite imagery, something almost as good as satellites, right? You got the viewer viewing, but you don't always see things. Sometimes you just get these impressions. Someone wrote in that in response to my Galactic Federation YouTube video the other day. It's funny. He said, Simeon, you're doing a lot of thinking and feeling here, but a lot of feeling and uh, kind of intuition. But there's, I don't see a lot of thinking going on. <laughs> well, look, it isn't a thinking-based thing. It's a feeling-based thing. You're getting feelings of colors and feelings of shapes and sizes. It's coming under the wire, which I mean, not consciously. It's just bubbling up. We don't have a lot of good words to describe it. So it seems to me a better way to describe it would be a, some sort of resonant perception. You're tuning into the frequency, the quantum frequency of a target, a place, a person. Mm -hmm. And if you're at the same vibe as something else, it's just going to spontaneously exchange information. And that's mm -hmm. the model I like to use because quantum mechanics is based on the idea of resonance, the resonance of right. particles and of matter and energy and it all comes down to Planck's constant and energy and frequency and we're talking if this is real which i believe it is it has to fit into quantum mechanics somewhere and i think resonance describes it more accurately than remotely just as an example guys if you're listening to a radio station it's actually not really remote because the radio wave is here and in the space any of us are in right now aren't there thousands of radio waves that you're not perceiving right so the idea is that the if you were perceiving it you'd be overloaded it'd be information overload and this is why your brain and your body do not let you do this all the time there's too much information right and you can't tune into all these stations so you're tuned into your reality at the moment but if you choose to tune into something else You've got leftover resources, it seems, to get accurate information from other things. And the information seems to me to be here in the same way that a radio wave is already here. Okay, Tommy, do you have any comments? Very interesting, actually. Um, and this isn't something I normally talk about very often. If I don't think I've ever actually spoken about it, to be honest, openly. But I've made a career on doing something very similar to this. Um, as it happens, I'm in IT. And I noticed uh, several years into my career that a person could call me with an IT problem and I could automatically go there in my mind and figure out exactly what this person was talking about. Because to be honest, most of the time they really don't understand what they're talking about. Right. right? So I, I began to think about that and, uh, and, and I kept doing it. And I noticed that the more I had to do that, I mean, I could be sitting in a chair all day completely relaxed and I'm like drained at the end of the day because I've had to... I call it traveling, to be honest. Now, I thought it was just, okay, I've been doing this for so many years. I know what I'm doing. I think I've seen it all. I can just guess what someone's problem is as soon as they give me a few key words. Well, I thought that until a couple of years ago when I was speaking to a man in Puerto Rico in a secure area where there's no cameras, and I had to tell him to move his head out of the way so I could see what the hell he was looking at. And which shocked him. He's looking at, there's not, there's not supposed to be cameras here. I know there's not cameras there. Please move out of the way. Um, literally I did that and, uh, I never forgot that. That was like the one time where it really kind of, uh, let's just say I saw the light on some things that are really extra reality. And right. uh, so yeah, I think I do this all the time. You do. And that, those are some great examples, Tommy. Thank you. This is something that we all use anyway in any of our professions, hobbies, anything you're really focused in, you're going to get a little more information than is you know how you got and Tommy, just like you're saying that you use it in IT, that is how Russell Tard and Daryl Bem, who were both amateur magicians and worked their way through college doing magic shows, they would say they got interested in ESP, this general area, psi phenomenon, because they seem to know more about the audience than they should when they were interacting with the audience and they didn't know how they were doing it. And that's how a lot of people get into this. And what you're saying makes a lot of sense is somehow it can even be with family members. Sometimes people in your family in other parts of the country, you just get this feeling something happened, you call them, 
or the phone rings and you know who it is. I actually happen to be the uh, son of a bona fide psychic female. So there is that. There you go. It runs in the family. <laughs> Apparently so. Yeah. Yeah. Now the truth comes out. But I would say this, uh, Tim, and to the rest of you, this, this already exists in us. This is a way to train it a little more. It's like you've already got the hardware, but you, no one told you about it. I guarantee you, no one, ta no one told me about it in school. Where's the manual? Yeah, the, you didn't get the manual. No one wanted you to do this. But we all do it from time to time anyway. This is just honing it in. Uh, in other words, instead of spontaneously doing it like Tommy does with an IT project, where he tells the guy to move his head out of the way because he wants to see it clearly, this is now where someone else assigns you a random target on something that's not directly involved in your life. And I always feel if you can do it with something that doesn't matter to you, then you'll definitely do it when it matters because you have a motivation when it matters, when it's something to do with your yeah. job and it, or people that you're involved with, uh, who you care about or survival, it's going to kick in. It's definitely going to kick in. But if you can do it on just a random target that I assign and put in a folder of the Washington monument or something and you get it, that's much harder. Sure. And that's why we train that way. If you train at the hardest level, in your life, it will kick in, and people have told me that it does. So, yeah. hey, one, the one thing I'm going to say before anybody else says anything, there's a lot of static coming from your feeds, Simeon. Static? Static, yeah. Every time you talk, like there's a lot of interference. Or something, or... I wonder why that is. I'm uh, using a very it, nice... It just started like midway through your when we were speaking, and all of a sudden it just started happening. Yeah, and it's gotten worse, and I just wanted to mention it. So if you, uh, during our video break with Joe McMonigle's clip, maybe you can take a look at that. And maybe reboot. Uh, is, do you hear it now? Yeah. Yes. When you talk. When I talk, that is like so weird. I've never had that happen. Like there's too much game. During the break, I'll close a number of applications. I'll close every application sure. that's not yeah. uh, being used. How about that? That'll work. Yeah, okay. if I'm, you know, me, uh, a little example of as well stuff that I've dealt with, with I've always had an ability, my grandfather taught me at a very young age, how to find arrowheads. And it wasn't about looking for the arrowheads. And it's about letting them find you and pull you to it. And it's something that you just don't know that it's there. But you just have to let it call to you and get to it. And in back in 2007, when I was visiting my agent, Barry Friedman, in vegas and we were going up to red rocks canyon to kind of see where they've had some you know meteors come down recently we're driving the car and all of a sudden i just have to pull the car off into the gravel i jump out of the car I was like everyone wait here run across the road down the hill up to a little stream down along a dry stream bed uh turn take a couple steps up and right at my feet is a meteorite I didn't wow. know what it was there. I had no idea where it was. I was never in that part of Red Rocks Canyon, but time and time in my life, again, in my life, I have this non-local awareness that tells me where something is that I need to so need to see and need to be there. And it just calls me and I just, you know, it's like that higher self that you're in contact with. It kind of, you know, you learn how to listen to. And then when it's there, you follow it. That's a good example. Yeah. I, I, I have a kind of a story like that, too. And I was all it's kind of a I don't know. Um, I was looking for four leaf clovers uh, when I was um, with this one lady friend and she could always find them and I could never find any. Not one. So I stopped looking really hard for them and I walked around the side of this barn and right in front of me was the largest four-leaf clover I had ever seen in my life. And I wasn't looking for it, but it was the size of my hand. And I picked it, and I showed it to her. She got mad and, of course, uh, took it out of my hand. But uh, the thing is, is I wasn't looking for it, and that's when I found it. Um, it, it just like I've always said it is, as a driver, you know, Tommy Highway here, um, the car doesn't find the, the, the driver doesn't find the car. The car finds the driver. Yes. I like that. That's great. Thank you. Guys, what you're talking about is all very important here. It's flow. The, the flow of something we're excited about that we're involved with synchronizes right. us with other things around us in a 
spontaneous way that is hard for our conscious mind to understand. Very, very much so. Very much so. And that's the same thing that happens during RV. It's not yeah. your conscious mind that's doing it. You're not thinking your way through it. It's just flowing and you're getting out of the way. It's a little intimidating because we're used to editing everything that we say and, you know, we care how we right. appear to other people, but you have to just let the flow go. And when the we always, is done, you... We always, we always want to take control. Right. We want to be in control. We want to have a set guideline of rules. You know, that's how we're indoctrinated. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And yeah. RV, that's, I'm really glad you're bringing this up. The RV is learning to let go of that control. We don't want it to disappear. We don't want the conscious mind to disappear. We don't want the ego to disappear. We just want there to be a communication and a balance between the, the conscious and the unconscious, the different aspects so they can communicate so that no one is, in, is dominating the whole thing. And it's really easy to filter out unconsciously. It's really easy to yeah. do that where you actually filter out the ability to do this because you, you, your, your conscious mind automatically kicks in and says, oh, this isn't possible or whatever. And then you automatically start dismissing the things that you're seeing. And I've right. been there too. And oh, then, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's a big challenge during the process is to teach the viewer not to edit anything out. Just write it down somewhere. When the session's over, we'll look through all of it. But... It's learning not to succumb to that critic, that internal critic we have. Thank you. That's always judging what we're doing. You can't get in the flow when you're in that fear state of being criticized by yourself, which is something you've internalized from the authority figures throughout since you were a little kid. And you're your own worst critic automatically off the, out of the, out yeah. of the gate. So. Sure. You're your worst critic, and that in teaching people how to do this, it's learning that there is no failure in an RV session. There are only outcomes. You you will learn more from the sessions that don't match the target than the ones from that do, because you don't know how you actually did it. So, every session is a good session if you learn something. Okay, um, I want to mention to everybody in the chat room that uh, Simeon has a whole bunch of training courses on his youtube channel so if you want to learn how to do remote viewing uh he is a very good source and i thought i'd mention that um after the live stream is over tonight we will put his link in our uh, summary and you can go there and check out all his video content and everything that he has uh it's a very important subject I think it may allow us to eventually ascend uh, on this planet to a higher resonance. Uh, that's what I've always thought. Um, and perhaps that is the case. Uh, if we all learn how to remote view or at least open up our minds to some type of connection with, with mass conscience, the conscience of the universe, the conscience of the planet, what do you think, doctor? Yeah, we, we have been instructed since the time we're born to really be pretty much focused on our identity as who we are as humans and how we fit into society. And that's necessary for society to keep going in a constructive way. However, that is not all we are. Right. There's more to us than we've been taught. Mm -hmm. RV showed that to me. And all these other topics is there's much more going on than your official identity within society. We all have an identity in society, be it our professions or our gender, our names. But those are sort of labels that have been created. It's a consensus by society. There's just more than that. And we want to get beyond those limitations because the universe also wants to communicate with us beyond our social identity. It doesn't want to be restricted by what you think you deserve or don't deserve. It wants to give you a lot because you, you are the universe and it your, needs your, to be, go ahead. Or your own perceptions of it. That's the thing. I think perception has a lot to do with this. I mean, we're, we're going, We like you said, we're actually born with a certain perception. We're actually raised by a certain perception, things like that. But then you have to be able to learn to uh, put that stuff under the rug for a moment and you have to learn how to uh, open your mind and realize that there are actually other realities or possible other realities or right. other things that we've never been taught. 
That's exactly right, Tommy. It's transcendence. I think we could just agree, call it transcendence. If you don't experience that transcendence, life begins to feel too superficial, meaningless. It doesn't have the oomph to make it seem like it it makes sense. When you experience these transcendent events, like an RV session, where you were somewhere else for half an hour, and you really felt like you were there, and you come back, I, it, there's this feeling of wonder that you get. And I think wonder is the healthiest thing you can feel every day because you realize there's something magical going on all the time. Nobody told you about it. Maybe people think you're crazy. So what? It's a good type of crazy because you can't really create. You can't really push the limits of your own creativity and ability unless you start connecting to this. And so many people that we consider to be successful, you know, CEOs throughout history, people that have invented amazing things, all talk about this. They get their inspiration this way, that somehow they go beyond, they see something, and they're crazy enough to believe in it, and here we are with all their tech, because <laughs> they believed in it, and everyone else thought they were nuts at the time, right? All of it. Do you think this would be a good chance to play the one of our videos? So Simeon, yeah, you know, we will. Out? We will in just a second, Simeon. They're suggesting in the chat that you unplug your mic and plug it back in. It might have a loose connection. Okay, we will give it a shot. Run the video, and I will. Uh, okay, do an audio we, we, diagnostic here. We will do that. Okay, add the stream. Here we go. Here's a video called Remote Viewing the Galactic Federation Headquarters. What did we learn by Simeon Hein? No audio, Tim. Hey, Tim, I don't think there's any audio for the video, is there? Do you hear audio? No, I can't. Okay, I'll start it over. Hold on. I had audio set up, but I'll do it again. Let's see here. I'll do it again. Just hold on. Okay. Got to do this. Okay, we're going to do this over, guys. All right. <laughs> Started at the beginning. Here we go. Well, hey there. How are you doing today? Simeon here with you. Welcome Should back be to able my to hear YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me. Glad to have you here. Well, the day has finally come where the Galactic Federation has made it into our news feed. I never thought I would see it happen, but it really has happened. Um, and this is really quite interesting to me for a variety of reasons. Uh, there was a news headline recently uh, from the Jerusalem Post in Israel that the former head of Israel's space division, space program, well, I guess it would be the equivalent of our head of NASA here in the U.S., Haim Ashed, I think is how you pronounce his name, uh, has come forward and said that the U.S. and Israel have been in contact with the Galactic Federation and that they've asked the U.S. and Israel not to go forward with plans for disclosure right now, something to that effect, because the Galactic Federation members thought it would cause too much panic on Earth. Now, uh, people have had a lot of different reactions to this. Is there a Galactic Federation you know, some time, something uh, like we saw on Star Trek Federation, uh, some sort of intergalactic organization uh, that, you know, is monitoring Earth. It's a very interesting question. All I can say for you is that I did remote view the Galactic Federation headquarters back when I was training at the Farsight Institute back in 1996. And later on, when I was inst an instructor there, we did give this target to students again, Galactic Federation headquarters and related types of targets. And I did get a structure 
a really tall structure on a very barren planet. Now, you have to keep in mind that these targets were done blind. You're not told ahead of time what you're viewing. It could be anything. It could have been the Eiffel Tower. It could have been Mount Kilimanjaro. It could have been the Washington Monument or at the time, President Clinton. But I did the target as the other students did in the class. And I remember a very tall, tall kind of obelisk like building on a very deserted like planet i remember getting occupants inside this building uh there are movement exercises you can give to viewers to move them around inside targets and we did move around inside this galactic federation headquarters and i remember there being you know humanoids inside and machinery and people working on tasks and things and that's the sort of thing I got for that particular target. And it was interesting that other people did get the same sort of results from their sessions, you know, kind of a tall building in a kind of a barren landscape somewhere, somewhere out there in the universe or maybe the multiverse. So what does this mean? How do we interpret results like this? Well, this is what we call an unverifiable target. Unlike other worldly targets or targets within our solar system or something that we can verify with feedback at the end of the session, this type of target, uh, we can't really verify it. So we can't really say exactly if our sessions were accurate or not. They're just sessions and you had an experience doing it. Is there a galactic federation? Well, there may be something like that. I've heard the channeled entity named Bashar, who you might be familiar with, talk about an association of worlds, a kind of collective of extraterrestrial species that, you know, form agreements and have some sort of loose organization. There could be something like a galactic federation. An RV session doesn't really prove anything one way or another. You're just left with the possibility that there was some consensus between those of us that did these targets, and I'm aware from looking at uh, Twitter recently that this was even being performed, I believe, by government viewers back as far back as 1988 from these declassified CIA documents. So people have been looking at this Galactic Federation target, obviously, for a while. Um, now, we have to remember, again, it's unverifiable. So it's just information. I, you know, just like Ingo Swan said, you know, we all prefer to do verifiable targets because we get feedback on the Eiffel Tower or the Washington Monument. And you can look at your session and see, you know, was it accurate or was I making some of it up? Is some of it more noise? Is it signal? You can do that from a verifiable target. An unverifiable target, you don't really know. Having said that, unverifiable targets are worth doing. Um, Mainly, they're a lot of fun. And secondly, it gives you an experience of something that may be just hard to describe in your native tongue, your native language. And, and that can be really useful because you have to, you know, part of the challenge during viewing, I like to call it resonant viewing, you're kind of uh, resonating with the same frequency of the target, kind of exchanging information like you would with a, mm -hmm. a radio transceiver, just as an analogy. You might get information resonantly that is, is not very easy to describe and that's it's the challenge of viewing is can you come up with words that describe your experiences during the session remember you're not editing anything out during the session you're coming up with impressions and ideas that are very hard to describe so non-verifiable targets things like ufos historical targets you know going to the future things like that are very interesting to do we can't verify them but they're useful to do as an experience to come up, you know, to face the challenge of describing things, technology in the future, for example, that we don't have yet, uh, that uh, push the limits of your mind to come up with new ideas to describe these experiences you had to review. And I think for that reason, they're good, they're worthwhile doing. And uh, maybe not as the only type of target you do. People expect a little too much, I think, from RV results. They want to know, did you view, you know, the Galactic Federation headquarters? What did you get? Well, you might have got something, but we can't tell if it's accurate or not. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have value to you as an experience. And let me just give you an example of that. In my book, Opening Minds, I wrote about someone I called Bob, who was given a similar type of target back when I was teaching him at Farsight. Uh, the target was something related to Mars, Martians, 
Mar Mars inhabitants in the past, something like that. The Martian technical elite, I believe that was technically the target queue. And by the way, Hamish had did mention something about Mars, about the US and Israel having an underground base on Mars. I mean, we can't really verify that or not right now. I guess we could do some viewing on it, but we did have a person view Mars, the extraterrestrials on Mars, a particular segment of their society. And he said that during the experience, a ball of light came into the room uh, where he was working at this hotel where we were based in. And he kind of reached out to touch it and he got a kind of a very strong shock. He said it was very painful. He was very upset after this session uh, from encountering this ball of light. And that sort of experience kind of goes hand in hand with these types of targets. In other words, what I'm suggesting is that when you view targets that are unverifiable and may push your uh, experiential levels of description to an extreme, you may you have to kind of widen your bandwidth. In the process, you start experiencing a broader range of phenomena, which might be there, but we don't see most of the time. You know, this idea that we're perceiving a lot more than our conscious mind is aware of, a theme of the book, The User Illusion by Taurus Neurotranders, which Ingo Swan mentioned on more than one occasion. We eliminate huge amounts of data that come into our physical senses just because our conscious and unconscious minds don't feel that they're relevant and it gets deleted. And the figure is apparently that we delete more than 99.999% for quite a number of nines there of all the perceptions that just come into our physical senses because our unconscious processes don't think they're relevant. Anyway, the point is that doing these types of exercises on uh, kind of exotic topics like that targets can broaden the bandwidth of your perception. And I think that's valuable. By the way, in this particular incident where the ball of light came into Bob's you know, uh, awareness, he saw it float in the room, but the monitor didn't see it. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. It's just she didn't see it, but Bob did. And uh, boy, was he upset after this for having experienced it. <laughs> but anyway, it's part and parcel of the whole process. People that are engaged in viewing uh, do experience things that they've never experienced before. When you broaden the, the kind of the bandwidth of your perception, you're going to see more, experience more of what's out there. Uh, perhaps in some ways it can be uncomfortable at times, but that's the nature of dealing with more of reality. It can be uh, exciting and it can be challenging. And so that's what I would say about these types of targets. Uh, it's fun to view them. You can set these up with a friend of yours, have them pick some targets and some verifiable targets, put them in an envelope. And they pick one out. Don't tell you what, what it is and you view it and see uh, how accurate it can be. Of course, uh, you're welcome to look at some of my uh, online classes if you'd like to try it out for yourself uh, and see how it works for you. But anyway, these unverifiable targets are a lot of fun. The Galactic Federation headquarters target was a lot of fun and it was a lot of surprise for me to see that particular name show up again in the public discourse. Uh, I'm not sure where it came from, originally, but again, to Sum it up here, it might exist. There might be something like that. It might be like the sessions we got. We'll have to wait for future information to know whether our targets were accurate or not. I think for the moment, we'd have to say in Ingo's parlance that we can't confirm one way or another, but it's certainly an interesting experience. And I think it's one that has value to do for the reasons I just explained. So now to learn more about remote resonant viewing, Subscribe to my channel here at the link below or uh, take a look at my website, learnrv.org. Learnrv.org, where I have information about upcoming classes, self-paced RV classes that you can do on your own and similar information. Okay, thanks. And we'll see you in the next video. Take care and bye. Outstanding. Very nicely done, sir. Yeah, very nice video. Um, how's, how's that, how's that? Uh, you're too low. I can't hear you. Too low. Okay, let me. I'm using a, a wireless mic now. How about oh, yeah. that? Is that a yeah. little better? Perfect. Perfect. I'm Darren. This is a this is a guitar quality wireless perfect. system. Perfect. <laughs> how's that? Yes. No, static. No, no static. 
Okay. Okay, good. Um, so thanks. Yeah, I'm glad you liked the video. And uh, yeah, that's how I feel about it. <laughs> I think it's a good experience to do these things. We won't know for a while. Someday, maybe we'll get information about something like a Galactic Federation and we'll say, oh, yeah, I got that in my session. I'll I do have that. one more small clip but, of yours I'd like to play. It's called How Remote Viewing Works. Oh, please do. Uh, video six by Dr. Simeon Hine. Is that okay? All righty, let's go, go with ahead. it. Uh, let's see here. It's not very long, so. I'll bring this up. Here we go. That was the fountain there. There's the viewer's drawing. And it's the fountain in the correct position. I believe in his analytical overlay, Calm, majestic structure makes me feel controlled. <laughs> I wonder why. But that's his description of the White House. And describes it as a vacation home for the rich. And the Pentagon, the subconscious never lies. This is the power of viewing. This is why they don't want you to know about this. Because you can't lie with RV. It just gets right to the heart of it. Now, the interesting thing about this session is he was actually describing the wrong target. I had a picture of the Space Shuttle Challenger in one pile, and this was going to be the next target in the following hour, and it was on another pile. And it appears that he viewed the target that I had not assigned. They were both in front, but I had signed this one. He had viewed, viewed the other one. It happens. The subconscious doesn't always do what we ask it to do, and that's fine. It's uh, like a pet in some ways. Uh, I mean, it does run your life, so it's not quite like a pet, but. It's doing everything, keeping your body going, uh, respiratory systems. It runs your whole body, but it, it can be, in, it can be, you can ask it to show you things, but in some cases it's like, it does what it wants. And that's, that's the nature of the viewing process. In this case, he described another trigger, but it was perfectly accurate. He says here, it's a sense of deliberations going on, power and control. He had all the elements of the White House in this post-session summary. Now here is a picture of this is TWA Flight 800. He did this back at Farsight back in 96, several weeks after the disaster when Flight 800 was destroyed over Long Island Sound. What I got in my session was something coming up from the ground. I saw this flash of light and something hitting something in the sky. And there you can see kind of a line going up and hitting something in the sky. And I, I, I got a missile. And I've talked to other viewers, some of that were here last year, and apparently other viewers have gotten this sort of scenario too. This type of target we can't confirm as easily as a simple picture because we weren't there when it happened. We don't know. A lot of people at Farsight got a missile, and if you've read into any investigation of this, the missile theory was really shut down by the NTSC, uh, B, and the, uh, all the agencies that were investigating this did not want to investigate this aspect of it, so we never really found out about that, and we were told apparently what they wanted us to hear about it, but nonetheless, the session suggests that a missile was involved in taking down TWA Flight 800. We don't know whose missile it was. And uh, here is a sense of the explosions and all the information related to that event. Now, this target is a verbal cue. This is the first official government announcement of the existence of extraterrestrial. This would be a future target, unless it already happened, you know, and we don't know about it, but in theory, this is a target that would happen in the future, and we wanna know what will the government announcement be like should it happen. Well, these targets are fun to do. We can't confirm them necessarily, but they're interesting to see what information we get. And this viewer got a sense of a performance, a theatrical nature, a lighthearted, something being staged, this could be the black budget disclosure. I mean, this may not be the one we want, but uh, the extra the edu it's educational material, uh, a sense of something being presented to the public. And uh, we're participating in things in a new way. So this is what we got for, uh, our, it has something to do with our place in the universe. That's what we got for that target queue. We, the way we do this, by the way, we write the, the um, queue on a piece of paper, put it in a folder, and the viewer says, view the target, they're not told what it is, and at the end they find out what the, the verbal cue was. It's that easy to view things, by the way. And here's a little picture that they drew. Isn't that kind of nice? There's 
pe apparently people and little ETs and something. This is called a symbolic sketch, and then there's some apparently little information being disclosed there between us and, and our friends. Uh, here, another viewer, did, it reflects a sense of glee, a feeling of history being made. Same target, by the way. First contact type of event. So if we were, are to believe this information, this government disclosure is going to happen at some point if these sessions are accurate. Something uh, functioning as a sense of uh, confirmation of different beings and so forth. So these are kind of experimental types of targets. Now this, session, this particular target was the evacuation of Dunkirk, Allied evacuation of Dunkirk during World War II, 1940. What I enjoyed looking at in this person's drawing was the drawing a Nazi swastika. No one's ever drawn that in any session I've ever seen anywhere, but he did do it for this particular, particular target, and this is a target about Nazis and the Allies back in World War II, and there's two types of symbols, a Nazi symbol and another type of symbol, and a person in a wave like water. Now, it did turn out that his uncle was in the Allied evacuation of Dunkirk and was shot in the water, so he had a personal connection to this target, which I didn't know at the time, but nonetheless, he went on to describe uh, two groups of beings that were once friends, as England was, uh, you know, Chamberlain and Hitler were originally friendly to each other. Uh, two groups of beings, and now one is oppressing the other and treating them just, you know, like something to be oppressed and destroyed. Mere offal to be dis disposed of. So this is a type of historical target. Here's a picture of Area S4 at Area 51. We were given this target by someone who had claimed they were there once, and they said, you see what's inside the hangars. Well, we gave it to our viewers and said, we have a target for you. That's all we said. A viewer in Utah was able to draw the hangars and apparently even the planes in front. Now, those I've been told by someone are, are Russian MiGs that are being tested there. But it looks to me an awful lot like hangars with planes in front. She did her own movement exercise. She went inside the structure, and what did she find? Flying disks. So this is proof that there are really reverse engineered UFOs or something at Area 51. It does, a lot of people seem to get these disks inside these hangars. And uh, again, it's just another use for RV. It's a lot of fun to do those types of targets after you've had training in the more basic types of targets. This was a target I did back in 1996. The target was the Gray's interdimensional wormhole near Earth. Apparently, um, Someone at Farsight had this idea that there, the grays were getting to Earth through a wormhole. I, I don't know if it's literally true or not, but this is what I drew, some sort of, looks like a wormhole to me, and some ships going around. And again, it's just kind of a neat drawing, a solar system and little ships going around. Again, these targets are done blind, so the fact that you came up with anything that's even related to the target concept at all is amazing. Whether it's literally accurate or not, I'm, we don't know, but it's certainly interesting to see the close match between the target descriptor and the actual the Mexico cool. UFO 1997. I've seen a lot of different presentations about this. I'm sure you have. Some people suggested it was a, a video hoax. Other people said no. The thing came over me and this purple liquid squirted out and I felt sick for six months. There were apparently about 20 witnesses to actually saw it. But you know what network television can do to these things. But we gave it to our viewers. So this viewer just drew what looks like a circular object. He walked into the ship and was told uh, no snooping. Don't, please leave. I didn't say anything to him. I said, do the target. And he said, I'm on the ship, and I'm being told to leave. There's a robotic being there, and I'm not welcome. I'm out of here. <laughs> the next viewer saw this chair inside that ship. Well, it doesn't look like any chair I've ever seen. <laughs> a space age type of chair that envelops you. It almost suggests the feeling of this kind of tactile type of information we've gotten about how craft are flown. It's a complete integration with your nervous system. Uh, and she's kind of suggesting that in the way the chair envelops you completely. It's a space age chair, and she started thinking about Courtney Brown all of a sudden. <clears throat> she said that you could, I moved her inside the object and described using her own words. She said it's a plastic bubble, and uh, it reminds me of space, it's curved, and it's something that you can go inside of. And she described a mechanical intelligence inside that uh, had a pointed head, <laughs> and so forth. Feeling a familiarity um, with, being, but it's impersonal. 
Again, this is what she got for that object. Does it confirm that it was there or not? I don't know. A close feeling, edited out, could be a UFO. Now, what she told me at the end is, when we're all done, she said, you know what I mean? I kept thinking this was a UFO, but I kept saying, no, it can't be a UFO. And we allow the viewer at the end to use EO, edited out, whatever they were thinking but didn't say at the time, just to show them that they were on the right track. Edited out UFO. OK, so now, does anyone have any really brief questions before we do the instruction? We're going to have you do the viewing now. Now, let me just describe before, if there are any questions about this before we go on. OK. Thank you for that video clip, Simeon. Really appreciate it. It's, it's an oldie but a goodie. That was one of the first YouTube videos I ever uploaded. So Yeah, 12 years ago. Very oh, good wow. video. Yeah, Very good still, video. so fascinating to see it now. Yeah. Yeah, I saw you uh, remembering uh, what you were saying. So yeah, it's that was, it's very interesting to find out what was actually at Area 51 and the fact right. that uh, Terry uh, found those discs yeah. in the Area 51 proper uh, hangers, not just at S4, but at Area 51. This gives us some information that none of us have had because we've always thought that the disks were only at S4. Right, that was actually Groom Lake. It wasn't S4, like I said. Someone corrected me later. That was Groom Lake, that picture. Yep. Oh, Groom Lake, okay, that's fine. Yeah, uh, we knew they were at S4. Uh, do you want me to share my screen to show a detail of that? Because it wasn't- Sure, so go ahead. Um, you so just I'll bring it up here. And I will, here's the target. I'll, I'll do a share screen, see if it. Uh, Should work. Just click on the share screen icon. Then you have to select the window you want. Yeah, you have to click on it. And then you click the share button. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if I can bring it up. Do you see it? No. No. Hmm. Click on share screen. Yeah. Uh, and click and on your computer. Your computer then at the very top, you can either have your screen application window or Chrome tabs. You probably want an app window. Let's see. Well, if we can't. If, if you can't bring it up, just describe it. Yeah, so uh, it's too bad. It's very clear on my screen. Um, it was this was one of the most shocking uh sessions i've ever been involved with because i literally had a three second conversation with the viewer terry in salt lake and i called her up 500 miles away I said terry i have a target for you do you want to do it I said sure send me the coordinates so i, I sent her the coordinates and she literally reproduces uh she literally reproduces the pictures uh, of the hangers and the MIGs in front. I mean, like, photographically reproduces the hangers and the MIGs. And I didn't, wasn't there. I don't say, you know, there's always the possible criticism that the monitor is leading the viewer. Okay, I'm right. not there with right. her. She's doing a solo target. She decides to move herself into the hangers. I didn't, wasn't there, I didn't say anything. She says, I'm seeing these discs inside. Uh, wow. Now that doesn't mean they're literally there, but I mean, it's an Area 51 target. We've heard all these stories from Bob Lazar and other people. Right. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the Norton Air Force Base 88 show where uh, one of Mark McCandlish's friends sees three flying discs hovering off the ground uh, uh, behind a curtain. Right. A, a demonstration being given for generals to get funding for this special access project involving what do they call the flux liner? Right. And by the way, those are on YouTube. Those guys have been having their own conferences. They call it Apex, uh, Alternative Propulsion uh, Conference, EP, EC, yeah. And uh, they've done three of them recently with Mark in some of them. And they, they talk about these flux liners, like they, they think they've almost figured out, maybe they have, 
But anyway, that was shocking to see that. So thanks for showing that again, Tim, after all these years. The, uh, the flex liner has been operational since like 1939. Um, uh, we've actually had quite a few and they're hyperluminal propulsion. So they're faster than light, which is amazing because they're man-made. They're reverse engineered, of course, but they're man-made. Yeah. And they su supposedly operate off the flux field. Right. So it's very interesting. But we have a question uh, in the chat from a Sir Christopher O'Dell. Uh, he wants to ask the question. He was in World War II. Uh, his grandfather was in World War II, and he did classified projects. And I would like to know what he did. Is there any way you can remote view that? Uh, well, Christopher could remote view it. <laughs> right. These projects take time and energy. And right. there's only some, you know, we've all, we're all very busy. There's only so many extra projects you're going to do. And sometimes they turn out strangely. You might not get the results that the person wanted. I will give you an example how complicated it is to do sessions for other people. And thanks for asking that question, Christopher. My dad was in World War II, and I did see that they, everything that he wrote on his letters back to his parents was blacked out. Half the letters were redacted when he mentioned dates, times, locations. He landed at D-Day on Omaha Beach. And uh, there was a lot of classification before they left because it had to be a total surprise, obviously. Right. But doing sessions for other people is very complicated just because we once were requested to do a session for someone's missing cat. And when we came up with that the cat had been eaten by a predator, they did not want to hear that. <laughs> I can imagine. And they wanted their money back, even though they had, we hadn't paid us anything. We were just doing it for them. But they were not happy with that because, you know, so doing any sessions for anyone else is much more complicated than any of you would think because you may come up with the re answer and they say, that's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Right, right. Um, so I generally don't do them for anyone else. We, I like to keep it for training and sometimes maybe just applied just for things I'm working on. But Christopher, you could do it yourself and just yeah. have someone assign you a target and see you, you, you know more than you think you do. That's what I'll say. Excellent. Yep. If I might say really quick, Christopher, if you have something that was near and, and dear to, to the departed, take it in your hand and hold it and feel the energy of the person who's gone. Clear your mind and talk to them. They can't read your mind, but just reach out and just whatever comes to mind, just kind of don't ask for it. Don't try and make it up. It's just, you know, listen, that's all you have to do. And there's, a, you know, there's, there's connections, there's ways you can get to it. But the biggest thing is having something that has a magnetic resonance on something that was around when them a lot, something that was in contact with them. And it's just, helps rebuild that connection. Right. Um, uh, you know, Thomas, can I just say one thing about that? Yeah. There's a whole branch of RV called psycho uh, psychometry. Yeah. And Bevy Yeagers was a real talented artisan of psychometry. She ran the U.S. Psy Squad in St. Louis. She was very successful and she worked, you might have seen her on TV with those other women psychics, the group of three women that work with police. They yeah. were on a lot. Yeah. Of, she was one of them. Okay. And I was lucky enough to take one or two of her workshops after the Irva conferences, uh, both in Nevada. Mm -hmm. And she described exactly what you said. Yeah. Is we would hold, she would give us a bag of some evidence or something, and we would write down what we got. And for her, it was the resonance of the of the of the matter of the objects of right. the evidence you would sense it now you don't literally need to do it but it works because you're holding it so what you're yeah. saying is, is correct yeah i kind of see like the earth like a giant like a giant hard drive we have this magnetic field around us that gives us this protection but also the energy underneath it so how can something like a keychain you know have a magnetic resonance to something what's it's just beyond us but it's there right I, and, I look, I, yeah. go ahead tim i'm looking at it this way we we all have magnetic fields holding in our energy, our resonance. So if we can tie that into the resonance of the earth and of the consciousness that exists between all life, then we become one with the flow. Isn't that about right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, just see, see the the ego conscious mind that we have. We've been taught this. We, I think it was Deepak Chopra that called it the skin encapsulated ego. Right. And that's the idea is that we sort of imagine that maybe we're in our head somewhere. In, in Japanese society, they would say you're kind of in your stomach area. For them, that's the center of the body. Every culture has a different idea of where you are, but it's sort of you have this space of a body and span of a lifetime. And you identify with that because you've been taught to identify with that ever since you showed up here. But you transcend it. And all of these studies, to me, show that's what's going on. You're just bigger than you think you are. Yeah. And every day we pretend to be small. So we fit in that identity because that's what re is required of us by society. But that doesn't. But at night, what happens? You start to dream. You you transcend those boundaries a little bit, right? In fact, you right. sleep so right. much you can't survive without sleep. It's so important for you to feel that connection. And so, RV is like the dreaming at night, but it's during the day. It's a structured daydreaming, and you know you can do it because I'm betting you've had dreams at night sometimes. And if you have dreams at night, you can do it during the daytime. It's just difference is you write it down because that connection begins to flow. You let go of that identity just temporarily while you're doing the session. When you're done with the session, you say end session. It's over. You come back to being who you are. But you can choose to have that sort of, you know, psychic flow temporarily on a specific thing. And it really seems to flow based on my experience with it and all the data. Okay, I got to ask you a question from the chat. Scratch in the chat said, we're learning EFP help. And the reason he's asking is because the stuff I'm reading teaches you to see everything in a different way. You could see the fields of everything. It definitely opened up my mind. What do you think about that? What, what was it he saw? Uh, I, I can see it here. See the fields right. of everything. Yeah. It does teach you, and that gets into this interesting idea of synthesthesia, which is why, you know, going back to your Tom, question, Thomas, it's not just viewing. It's feeling sensory information, and it can come across in different ways. And some people see it the way Scratch is talking about in terms of fields of color. I've right. met several viewers that I either trained or worked with who started spontaneously drawing beautiful pictures of landscapes or what they called soul portraits, they now felt that they could look at somebody and see an aura of energy around them. And they drew one of mine, which is beautiful. I have it actually, it's in opening minds. I put the picture of Doris's soul portrait. Now, she's not the only one. Other people have had this experience that when you activate the right brain more, which is what viewing uses the non uh, the non logical linear mind, the, the right side that's more holistic and sees patterns. It can activate a part of you that's an artist uh, that you didn't know you had. We all have that. Now my artistry comes through guitar. I'm a musician more than visually oriented, but everybody has something that if you let it go a little bit, it can make something really cool, and you you can surprise yourself. So that's a good way to start. Is just Everyone, well, here's what I'm trying to say. Everybody's wired differently. There's no, right. it's not like school where we all sat in chairs and we all did. Everybody views differently. Some people are better at smells. Some people are better at colors. It, it's just the way we're hardwired. There's a path of least effort by which that information gets to us. And you, everyone listening, you need to discover what's your strength there. What's your path of least effort in terms of perception? Right. Uh, because nobody knows until you try it you'll then you'll find out then you'll uh, find out. we got a question up on the screen for you simeon hey um, yes yes so uh amy was in my class a couple about half a year ago or so was it yeah and that was in the online classes by the way i do them online now and since right. we, uh, so we have one coming up in January, by the way, just to mention January 9th and 10th. Okay. Uh, if you go to my sites, you can get the information blog. You could, it, it was on the learnrv.org. You put that up. But so any, any took the class. And so she had an experience of an ET. So I'm not surprised. <laughs> this is, it's not just ETs, but they're around. 
my belief. And so you're going to start picking up on things. It happened to me too. You're going to start picking up on things that you didn't pick up on before. Uh, we want this to be a positive experience for you. For most people it is, but I have to be honest with you. For some people, sometimes something comes through that they never knew about in their life. It could be a repressed memory. It could be an ET abduction. Um, it could be things that showed up at your window when you were young that you have forgotten about. Because I can't tell you how many times people have taken the first beginning class where we don't do ET stuff. Let me just tell you, in the beginning classes, we just do verifiable targets. We don't go to the exotic stuff. That's the advanced class. Right. And that's just to tune up the system with ordinary targets of things that yeah. you're familiar with. So many people, though, I have found had repressed memories. Uh, I've seen people break into tears during an RV session. It had nothing to do with the target. A memory came back of something that happened as a kid that felt scary to them involving, I guess, what we call ETs. We don't even know what we're yeah. dealing with here, folks. Guys, we don't know what's on this planet. Can I just say something? We don't know what's out there. We're going to find out. There's a lot more than we've been told, obviously. Yeah. And we call them ETs. Maybe they're interventional, but people experience this. And so right. I'm not surprised any that you had that because even if you weren't looking for it, opening up that the, the boundaries, the, the the bandwidth of perception, as I call it, you start seeing a little more than you knew about consciously. The conscious mind is really good about filtering things out. So you're not filtering during our recession. Things come back, and this has happened. I once gave a photo of that house that Woody Allen used in that movie called Sleeper. I love that movie. I-70 up here. What's that? I love that movie. Yeah. So he comes back in time later on, everything's futuristic. And they used that house off of I-70 here in the <clears throat> Rockies, not far from Golden, Colorado. I gave her that picture as a target and she burst into tears. And uh, what is going on? And it reminded her of the UFOs that she had seen as a kid that she had forgotten about until the class, just sitting there looking at the target and it comes back. So we, many of us may have had experiences that we have forgotten about with other types of beings or entities. I know that's not scientifically defensible, but this is what I believe based on my experience with people uh, experiencing this. I mean, why else would you just show them a picture of something round and circular and they, they, they go into a panic? Why? Right. They have to have an ex yeah, it's a good question. Right. Um... I do have one last clip I'd like to play because I want to get your impression of uh, Simeon. This is a clip by Joe McMonagle, uh, where he uh, remote views Mars. And I advertise this uh, on the live stream, so I, I need to play it for the people in the chat. So here we go. Renee Cruz was asking about it. So here we go. It's not a very long clip, so... Here we go. Oh. In May of 1984 at the Monroe Institute, uh, I had been training with Bob for almost 14 months learning to control my out-of-body experiences. I had had spontaneous out-of-bodies for many years, and Bob had been training with me in his lab at the last year of my time at the project, Stargate project, to teach me to control my out-of-bodies. I wanted to see if controlled out-of-bodies were better at producing information, collection information, than remote viewing. It turns out you can do very specific things with out-of-bodies that you can't do with remote viewing, but it's, I don't think it's as good. If you want to know how the trigger mechanism works on a Chinese nuclear weapon, out-of-bodies better because you can go to the Chinese nuclear weapon and put your face in it, look around, do detailed drawing. But if you want to know where all the parts from the weapon came from, remote viewing is better because all the parts are intricately linked together data-wise. So things are 
different for how you want to do things. Um, in, in any event, during that period, um, my training officer, Skip Atwater, would come in from the project and test me to see whether or not my remote viewing was getting any better. And one of his tests that he brought, one of the training tests that he brought, was a target that I didn't know anything about. I, normally, I did mundane targets like quasi-military targets. Well, this particular week, he brought a Mars target. I didn't know it was a Mars target. But he gave, gave a sealed envelope, neither did Bob Monroe. He gave a sealed envelope to Bob Monroe, which inside had a card that said Mars, one million years BC. Bob thought it was another moon day target as well. And he had a uh, list of uh, coordinates. So Bob had this uh, card in his shirt pocket, and we had a list of coordinates as targets. And the first set of coordinates was uh, 44.89 degrees, 9.55 degrees west. I didn't know anything about the targets as I was laying in a dark black cube in the lab floating on a sea of salt listening to hemisync tapes. And the first thing I heard was the coordinates. And this was my response. I got a great view of a pyramid pyramid form, sitting in a large depression, it's yellowish ochre colored, I get clouds, a severe storm, major geological trauma. Then I was asked to visit the site before the trauma, they said go back before the trauma. They said all the dirt had disappeared, there were now smooth walls, everything was flat, megalithic. I said something about gee, is this a new pyramid? Did they discover a new pyramid? Because it's really large. Shadow of people, fragments, memory of people. They said, go back to when they were there. Large people, thin and tall, wearing strange clothes, skin tight, very tight, almost can't see them. This is the actual target based on the coordinates. That's the face everybody's always referring to on Mars. This is actually the depressed area. This is the pyramid. It's actually a double layered pyramid. This is the second set of coordinates that I got. In a canyon looking up steep high walls that go on forever. Very intricate, huge sections of smooth stone carved out. Getting very large structures. Rabbit worn of huge corridors and rooms. I said the rooms were really large. And again, I said something to him about this has got to be some new pyramids or something because I don't remember ever seeing rooms this size in. Giza or anywhere like that. That's a canyon, and that's the pyramid. Now, what's really interesting about this particular pyramid, is you notice it's sitting on the side of the impact crater. And that's a real trick, because that means the pyramid had to be put there after the impact crater. Because if the impact crater hit after the pyramid was there, it would have destroyed the pyramid. You can't have one and not the other. You understand what I'm saying? If that crater, if that crater appeared after the pyramid, it would have destroyed that pyramid. The other interesting thing about this picture is you can measure the shadow of the crater, and based on the angle of the sun, you can estimate the size of the crater wall as being 3,000 meters tall. So that's a pretty deep crater. Now look at the shadow on the pyramid. Pretty tall pyramid. That's a 20,000 meter tall pyramid. Pretty big. Wow. 
That's not the only thing interesting. That pyramid had to have been formed after the crater was formed. Here's something else interesting. That pyramid's even closer to the edge. And here's an even more interesting fact. There's the road in, there's the road out. I just find these really remarkable pictures. Here's another, this is a general area. Pyramids huge, but different this time. The reason these were different is because they were a cluster. These are like shelters from storms. Designed for sleeping, I specified hibernation, sleeping through savage storms. I'm asked to find out why. They're an ancient people trying to survive that's past their time and age. They're waiting for the return of someone sent to find a new home. Their world passed through the tail of a comet. I had a sense that their atmosphere was stripped away or, or destabilized when it passed through the tail of the comet. This is an old fort. Now what's interesting about the old fort, and it's something most people don't recognize, this is actually a pyramid. That's one side, that's the other side, that's the other side. The tip is missing off the top and it's hollow. I don't know if you can see that. Kind of interesting, isn't it? They call it the old fort. It's always referred to as the old fort. But that's a pyramid that's been tipped off. The tip's been taken off. Those are, that's a grouping of pyramids. And that's a building, or what's left of a building on a sort of a plateau. Or, and that's the drawing I did of the larger beings. What I think in actuality, there really are no such thing as Martians. What I think Martians are is us. I think we're descendants of the original inhabitants of Mars. And we're the ones that never went back. Okay. We're the ones that never went back. So according to him, we could be descendants, direct descendants of Martians. Of course, that's his perception from his remote view. What do you think about that, Simeon? Uh, I Maybe. I mean, we don't know. Was that applied remote viewing? Yeah, he was doing applied remote viewing. It's, it, I have to say the uh, we got similar similar data for the pyramids, space on Mars. You know, I viewed all of that too. Many other people have at the time I was doing it. It was the same as what Joe got. A right. civilization that had been there, a possibility of us uh, being related to Mars in some way. I, I don't know if that's literally true. It's uh, just don't have any way to know one way or another, but it doesn't right. seem out of the realm of possibility. I mean, uh, there does seem to have been a civilization there at one point, and, uh, and maybe there's still beings there underground or something. Uh, it, it, it can't be ruled out. I mean, there does seem to be a lot more going on on Mars than we've been told about. And uh, I remember hearing an interview on Art, the old Art Bell show, a woman that had worked at NASA on the Mars, uh, observe, one of the Mars probes. And she said at one point they saw something coming across the horizon towards the rover. And they were right. all ordered to go out of the room and they put up newspaper right. on the windows and one person looked in, they didn't do it perfectly well, looked into a crack in the newspaper in the window, and they saw someone polishing the lens on the rope. Oh. They were wow. polishing. That's what they saw. So, I mean, that totally makes sense. That how is that thing going to survive on its own without the dust? You know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some, if we're there and they maintain the rover. <laughs> I've actually seen photo shots of where the rover is completely covered and caked with dust from the windstorms. 
Yeah. And then they show another picture and it's completely cleaned. All the electronics, everything. You can't tell me that the wind blew it off. There's, it was the no. That's yeah. that explains everything now. That explains everything. There's a guy in the shit. They were in spacesuits and they were yeah. cleaning it. Yep, I saw, I saw those pictures. Yep. So, yeah, yeah. What do they call it? What do you tip? They call them like cleaning that? events. Sorry, go ahead, Tommy. I mean, yeah, thank you. Martian beer. <laughs> Martian <laughs> beer. Uh, you know, Joe's an excellent viewer, and I'm just going to show you a couple more pictures of what he's done. Okay. So go ahead. Ahead. This is from the Ed May's great book. ESP Wars East and West about the Soviet and American RV programs. And, and, and there was, you know, they were in conflict for a while before they finally met and they, they went over from the U S to meet their counterparts. But look at, look at some of these things he's done in the past. I mean, you've seen these, the uh, wind turbines. Right. Wow. Uh, east of LA. I forgot what the pass is. Uh, one of the passes out there has look and look at the drawing. Uh, so well done. And then, then there's this part electron accelerator. This is right. Joe's. These are, I think, double blind sessions. Uh -huh. So there's not even remotely chance that the monitor is. Now look at this is a, a famous one that he did <clears throat> with the SRI folks. I forgot who it was. They sent out an outbounder to one of the buildings on the Stanford campus. And it had to be the, uh, it, was, it was the Westgate of Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, which I think is is right in the area wow yeah. and that's what joe got he even got to look at the line of trees there it's very Along impressive the road. Right? so joe is just you know as good as it gets so when he wow. and the reason i'm showing that to you is that's what he does with verifiable targets so when he does that accuracy with verifiable targets where it's nearly picture perfect right. you are inclined to believe his viewing of something else, even though we can't verify it in the same way because he's has such a good track record. Uh, and so, yeah, it's fun to view those other types of targets. And one day it wouldn't be great if we found out what, you know, what was really going on with it. It'd be good if we could get Joe to come on with you sometime. That'd be great. Sure. Um, then we can get, uh, some information about his findings and uh, his classes too at monroe I, I mean i don't think they're doing them now but if you're interested he teaches and he, he, that's okay. an a lifetime to go spend a couple of days with him learning his method mine is the ingo method the written <clears throat> system crv he uses his own method which works just as well for him and it's just another spontaneous way of doing it Right. Everybody in the chat has been mentioning uh, comments on uh, what they're interested in us discussing in regards to remote viewing. But uh, we're going to be bring uh, Dr. Simeon Hine back again so that we can go further into the subject and deeper. I want to thank you very much for coming tonight, Dr. Hine. I appreciate all your commentary, all your hard work. Um, keep Keep doing what you're doing because um, I, you've made a big impression on me. So I will definitely be looking into it. Um, I am interested in the CE5 initiative with Stephen Greer, and I hear you were involved with that yep. on uh, maybe one or two occasions. Thomas was mm -hmm. telling me about it. Mm -hmm. uh, next time we have you on, we'd like to talk to you about that. Um, but I think what we're going to do is take everybody's last comments. Tommy? Dr. Hine, thank you very much for coming. You really have opened up my mind to this subject. Um, and I've always, and again, as I, I was uh, detailing my examples, my personal examples of my experiences, I mean, a lot of what you said really rang true. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for opening my eyes, sir. Oh, thank you. Thomas? Simon, Simeon, thanks for coming. It's uh, definitely a pleasure to get with you on the other side of the screen and to bring you along. And, uh, you know, it's always an adventure hearing what you have to say. And, you know, yes, thanks for thank coming. Thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you, guys. And thanks for being crazy enough to want to explore this really interesting topic. <laughs> yeah, we, we needed to look into it for quite some time. It's just uh, when you get wrapped up in your little box that you're in, and, and I'm in a box, I'm kind of in a niche, you know, with uh, my title being UFO man, I kind of have to concentrate on UFO content, but it's always nice to expand our horizons and get out of the box and look 
at uh, what I call burgeoning uh, technology, which is uh, remote viewing. So um, I want to thank you very much for uh, coming. And we hope to see you again. And we hope you have a very Merry Christmas and a happy holidays. Well, thanks a lot, guys. And for anyone who wants to do some training in January, during January 9th, 10th, just contact me for the online class if you want to try it out for yourself. So. Right. Okay. Okay, guys. Thanks very much. And we'll talk to Here you again. Yep. Yeah.